folks play some membership, and it's a ex good congregation and exciting one to be around. And we thank you for your presence and your participation. I uh, forgot to get Joey uh, a note here from Faye Hickey, her first cousin, Steve Cowan, has cancer, and she'd like for us to remember him in our prayers as well. Steve Cowan, the first cousin of Faye Hickey. And really good to have Vernon and Megan here today. They recently obeyed the gospel here at Holiday and nephew of Mark. And uh, we work together, and so it's good to have Vernon and Megan with us this morning. All of you, especially visitors, are welcome as uh, the rain would be if we had some. So, amen. <laughs> Don't fuss on the weather, though. There's nothing we can do about it. Just trust in the good Lord for sure. Well, the lesson this morning is about our elders. Could get in trouble, but I hope not. Uh, I'm going to preach about our elders and authority. Our elders and authority. Let's read for a text from Titus chapter 1, where Paul is instructing the preacher Titus, one of his missionary helps, concerning elders. Titus chapter 1, verse 4. To Titus... My own son, after the common faith, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, the island of Crete, as he left Titus there. Why? That thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I appointed thee. So a very important part of the work of the church is that there be elders. And if they be um, blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop, showing you the interchangeableness of the word elder and bishop, must be blameless as a steward of God, not living in sin, not perfect, but not living in sin, repenting when doing wrong, not self-willed, certainly going to not be a good example in a problem to the work of the church if an elder is self-willed not given to wine, not a striker, or a given to the love of money, filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, and holy, and temperate, self-control, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine to exhort and convince gainsayers, false teachers. So a lot of his work is going to be taking care of making sure that the truth is presented and not false doctrine. Verse 10, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially among the Jews, the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. They subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for the love of money or filthy lucre's sake. Whose mouths must be stopped. Elders have the responsibility to stop someone in the pulpit or the classroom if they are not teaching the truth. They stop them. They stop their mouths because they know that they will do great harm and hurt to the body of Christ. Good. Great chapter of introduction. The qualifications for elders, the men that are wanting among us, are given in Acts chapter 28, 1 Peter chapter 5, Titus 1, where I just read, and 1 Peter chapter 3. The qualifications we're not studying in our sermon today, but we are concerned about the authority of elders. How much authority do elders have? To some of you, I want to introduce our three elders that we have at Holiday. I believe they're three good men, and they work together well. They are team workers. They do not seem to exhibit this attitude that they must have their way. No man should have his way. Every man should have his say is a good saying among leadership that do a good job and I know all three of them have the ability to uh, certainly have their say and they're not men who are determined they must have their way or be self-willed men. By alphabetical order our three elders are Henry Armacadian and uh, Henry is from Iran not Iran. Henry said they didn't ran him out. <laughs> he's not uh, Iranian. He's a uh, E. Esau, what are you, Henry? Iran, an Armenian from Iran. 
Henry came over here following his big brother going to Tennessee Tech and graduating as an engineer, which he's still working at that position. His wife, Crystal, uh, taught school and retired from that work. Uh, they have a daughter, Ashley, who lives in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, and is a Christian. Uh, Henry brings a lot of work and drive to the eldership. Along with Crystal, they are involved in, in not do as I say, but do as I do, and that's the good kind of leadership that we need. Alphabetical order, we have Tommy Randolph, of course, Tommy and Joanne. Tommy is a carpenter. He's slowing down a little bit, but not much. He's a fine carpenter. They are uh, good shepherds to the flock. They really work hard at trying to see about families and see about situations and deaths and sicknesses and uh, appreciate um, Tommy's ability to get involved in shepherding. And then um, we have Lonnie Hickey. I guess I didn't do it in alphabetical order, did I? Uh, I didn't, I ate too many biscuits this morning, I think. Lonnie Hickey and Faye, their son Keith, as a faithful member here. Of course, uh, Tommy and Joanne have sons, John and, and Joy and his lovely family. They're faithful members here, and we're blessed by them. Uh, Lonnie's was a dairyman for many years. In the last few years, he's worked in Fixture World and in Baxter. He's quiet. He didn't say a whole lot, but he's got that uh, good common sense and logic that I've noticed and appreciated through the years that whenever Lonnie says something, it's worth listening to. He don't say a lot, but he's, he's got it down when it's, he has a lot of uh, what farmers would say, a lot of horse sense, a lot of good common sense, and uh, he knows how to work well with others. So these are the three men who are, are our shepherds for the congregation here at Holiday. It's a great responsibility. I think Hebrews 13 and verse 17 and it says it about as well as it possibly could be shown to us in the scriptures, the grave responsibility of being an elder. Obey them, that's to us, that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Obey and submit. Why? They watch for your souls as they that must give an account and that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. There's somebody that's watching over my soul. And it, of course, it comes from the eldership. There are the shepherds. Got a sick lamb here. We are visited or prayed for or talked to by those who watch for our souls. They will have to give an account for their stewardship uh, before the Lord Almighty, and that's a, a very challenging thought for sure. But there are rewards and blessings too. God has a plan for the leadership of the church to be these men who meet these qualifications, and uh, they're needed, as we saw from Titus 1, the things that are needed in the church. Elders, good elders are certainly needed, but they watch for our souls. And they need to be able to do that with joy. That's where we come in. We could help their work to be a joyous one if we were good, faithful servants of the Lord. Another verse that shows to us the grave responsibility, Acts 20 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul is meeting the elders of Ephesus, and uh, they meet at Miletus. And in verse 28, he says to them, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, elders, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. Elders are overseeing the work. That is their responsibility. They have the right and should practice the wisdom of delegating as much as they possibly can to deacons, to preachers, to members of the congregation. They don't have to do everything, but they need to make sure everything's done. They oversee the work, and they're the leadership that's needed. They can delegate to me, choose the speakers for vacation Bible school. And I call someone up and I say to this brother, uh, could you help us at vacation Bible school? That certainly is right, 
And that's the proper procedure. They delegated to me that responsibility. So it is here that we see the need of elders overseeing and also feeding the flock, making sure the congregation is fed the truth and fed the gospel, not fairy tales and jokes and, and laughter all the time, but good, solid teaching that's from the scriptures. They are the ones who feed the flock. You don't feed the flock sugar and sweetness. You feed them the substance they need to be good health. And so it is that that's the responsibility of preachers, but taught, overseen by the elders, and made sure that the congregation is fed, according to Acts 20 and 28. There's a great passage from Ezekiel 34 where the leaders are rebuked in Jerusalem, the shepherds, because they had not been doing a very good job. And I think we can apply it to the work here and anywhere God's people are meeting, the responsibility of elders being good shepherds. Ezekiel 34 and verse 1, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy, I say unto you of them. Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? We don't have any problem feeding ourselves. What are we feeding the flock? You eat the fat and you clothe yourselves with wool, and then you kill them that are fed. But ye feed not the flock. The disease have ye not strengthened. Neither have you healed that which was sick. You've not been taking care of the lambs. Neither have you bound up that which is broken. Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. And neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty you've ruled them. Seeking the lost lambs is the responsibility of the shepherds. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field because they were scattered. Verse 6, My sheep wandered through the mountains and upon the hills. My flock was scattered unto the face of the earth, and none did seek nor search after them. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. A text talking about the leaders of Israel, their shepherding failure, and it very well can apply to the, the leadership of the church. I want to speak just also in our lesson for a few moments. We thought about um, the need of elders, overseers, and shepherds, and um, introduced our shepherds here to you, some of you, and spoke about being team players. But a very important part or question that we're addressing today is, what about the authority of the elders? How much authority do the elders of the church have? Do elders of the church have the authority to change the plan of salvation? That the baptistry water's been cold. We can't get it functioning properly. And so we'll just leave that part out. It's too cold, the old building. The water's stagnant. And so we're, we're going to cut the baptisms out, just have a confession of faith, and let it go with that. The elders have that authority to make that decision. No. And we've decided also that we're going to bring in a piano and a few guitars and uh, have some musical, mechanical instruments of music in our worship. It might liven it up and get us on key and get our tempo up. Do elders have the authority to do that? No. How much authority do elders have? They do have authority. There's no question about that. In Hebrews 13 and verse 7, Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And remember the good reading that was done from 1 Peter 5 earlier that today, that elders are the ones that should, verse 2, feed the flock, having the oversight, and they're not, in verse 3, to be lords, but to be examples to the flock. The question is, do they have authority? Certainly, they certainly do have authority. But how much authority? They cannot go beyond that which is authorized by the Lord. That's already been decided. The plan of salvation has already been decided. It's already been set down from heaven. 
And that plan of salvation includes faith, repentance, and baptism for the remission of sins. Jesus said in Mark 16 and 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So he certainly included baptism. And in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, go into all the world and teach all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all power is given unto me. It is spoken of Jesus. All authority is given unto him. So the Lord's already established. He's already been set in print. It's already been established in the Word, in the Scriptures, that baptism and the plan of salvation, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, so elders do not have the authority to go beyond Jesus. He's the head of the church, Ephesians 1, 22. He's the head of the church. Colossians 1 and 18, he's the head of the church. So elders cannot go beyond that which is authorized, and the scriptures have already declared the plan of salvation. What about instrumental music, instruments of music and worship? Well, once again, it's already been established what God desires. To two congregations, Ephesians 5, 19, and Colossians 3, 16, we have the scriptures given concerning what God wanted or wants in worship. That all the scriptures indicate that we should, let me get it here exactly right, Colossians 3, 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Singing, authorized, Colossians 3, 16, Ephesians 5 and 19. So it's been established. It's been set what God desires. If he had wanted instruments of music, they were certainly in the Old Testament, and they existed in the New Testament times, but there's not a mention of it. But that God desires that we sing and offer praise unto God through singing. So elders cannot usurp what's already been established by the head of the church. He's established the plan of salvation. He, the Lord, and the Holy Scriptures have established the worship that God desires. What about time of services? No problem there. The elders have the right to change. Last Sunday we met at 1.30. Is that scriptural? Yeah, that's, a, that's right. It's okay. That was a decision made by the eldership that was thought would be a good thing to do. The scripture demands that we meet upon the first day of the week. That's all that it says. Acts 20 and verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Was 1.30 last Sunday afternoon the first day of the week? Yes, it was. It was the first day of the week. So elders have the right to do that. What about um, the color of the carpet or the painting on the walls. Yeah, they have the right to uh, delegate that responsibility to deacons to take care of. As long as they recognize the higher authority, and that is the scriptures, the word, what God has dictated, what God desires for worship or for the plan of salvation must be honored and respected and certainly is by our eldership. No doubt about it. They are team players. They're qualified men who are striving to serve the Lord. We appreciate their love for the Lord and appreciate yours. Perhaps there's one here today that needs to repent of sins, to obey the gospel by repentance, faith, and baptism for the remission of sins, and become a part of the body of Christ as we all strive together to glorify the Lord and to please Him from whom all blessings flow. If you're subject, would you come now while we stand in sin? Cleansing pot, are you washed in the blood?